Can the way we think about time help us to navigate change? I first began thinking about time differently 20 years ago, when I was facing the need to make changes in my life. When most people turn 30, they plan something fun, like throw a party, go to a concert, or take a trip with friends. When I turned 30, I booked myself into a 40-day silent retreat. Yes, I am a super fun introvert. <laughs> I know that kind of experience isn't for everyone, but I was feeling the need to get a different perspective on my life. I had a career that was rewarding, but intensely demanding. I was coming home at the end of each day feeling flat and exhausted. It was meaningful work and felt good to know I was helping people, but spending every weekend just recovering from work isn't much of a life. I'd spent eight years in university preparing for this career, and I thought it was what I was meant to be doing. But I felt increasingly depressed and uncertain about whether I could keep going. And as I started to doubt my life choices, I started to feel anxious about the future. Maybe I was just having my midlife crisis a little early. So I went for 40 days to a remote retreat center. My only conversations were with a spiritual director who guided my process. One exercise was to meditate on this question. Think about the decision that you're making, and now imagine you're looking back from the end of your life. What decision will you be glad that you made? This question pulls us out of our usual place and time and helps us see ourselves and our situation from another perspective. Why is this helpful? Western culture sees time as linear. The past is gone, the present is fleeting, and the future is rapidly approaching like a train coming toward us. This exercise of looking back from the end of life helps us to step outside of our usual place in linear time. And by stepping outside of the usual pressures pushing us forward, we discover the freedom to make different choices. But even when we get that perspective, our fears can make it really difficult for us to accept that freedom. I'd invested so many years of study and work in my career, it felt unthinkable to leave it. I tried to imagine giving up the sense of identity and purpose that came with my career. I just felt anxious and scared of the unknown. But as I reflected on this question over the weeks of the retreat, I began to realize I did have the freedom to create another path. Because the persistent message from my future self was, if this work is making you so unhappy, this is not what you're meant to be doing. I needed to create another path where I could flourish as a whole person. Part of my resistance to this process, though, was an assumption that I should have already figured all this out. I was at a time in my life when I should be gaining experience and expertise in my career, not starting all over again. From childhood, we're conditioned to think of time as an objective measure that we exist alongside. And a big part of being an adult is keeping track of it like the timetable in a train station. The trains leave with us or without us. Maybe this is why European culture came up with the idea of father time. He's a grim figure, glaring at us with his gimlet eye. He's got a huge iron sickle in one hand, ready to reap on New Year's Eve. We've created this social construct of time, and now he keeps us on the run. The conditioning to measure our lives against the stopwatch of time may seem inevitable and inescapable, but it's a cultural practice, a collective habit. So I'd like to share with you three ways we can break this habit so we can make decisions in our life with greater freedom. The first thing that we can do to move into a mindset of greater freedom is just what we've been doing here. We can start to question the assumptions that we make about time and start to untangle ourselves from those assumptions. Fortunately, we do have some built-in warning systems that tell us when it might be time to do that. And these include exhaustion, frustration, and loneliness. It's when we hear ourselves saying things like, 
I just don't have time to do the basics, like get enough sleep, eat good food, get a little exercise, spend time with friends. We're living as if our core belief is, I don't have time to create the kind of life where I can be healthy and happy. Recognizing that core belief is the first step toward realizing, recognizing that false belief is the first step toward realizing we can change it. It's only when we become aware of our assumptions that we can begin to change them. Although I didn't realize it at the time on my retreat, I needed to unlearn ways of thinking that were no longer working for me and retrain my brain to see my life from a perspective of greater freedom. We have to question the hold that social constructs of time have on our thinking. Because if we don't, our dysfunctional relationship with time will drive us and drain us in ways we don't even realize. A researcher, Dr. Robert Levine, compared the pace of life in 31 different countries. He looked at variables like the speed of walking, the pace of work, and the accuracy of public clocks. Countries with a faster pace of life tended to be more individualistic, had higher rates of smoking, and higher rates of death from heart disease. So the way we think about time isn't an academic question. It's a powerful force that acts on us. It affects everything from the way we move through our days, the way we plan our work, the way we take care of our health, how we respond to unexpected interruptions, and how often we stop to smell the roses. So this is the key insight. The way we think about time impacts how we experience time. The Journal of Experimental Psychology published a study that confirmed that the language we speak impacts how we experience time. There are many cultures where time is not spoken about as linear, but cyclical. Time can be a wheel and not a line. Many Eastern cultures, traditional Gaelic culture, and some First Nation cultures have a cyclical understanding of time. And so because humans get to choose how we think about time and how we talk about time, if we are thinking about it and talking about it in ways that aren't helpful to us, we can find another way. So if Father Time is getting you down, choose another metaphor. Maybe time can be a wise woman that guides us in weaving together the threads of our days to form the fabric of our lives. The big shift I needed to make was to stop thinking about my life as having a plan that I needed to follow on a certain timeline. Instead, I chose to leave my career and trust in my ability to create a better future. Because I knew that at the end of my life, that's a choice I'd have been glad that I made. And so that leads us into the second way we can break the habit of being constrained by time and move into greater freedom in making decisions. We can pay attention to the language we use when we talk about time in everyday conversations. What kind of language do you hear yourself using? Is it ever passive or helpless? If we ever hear ourselves saying things like, oh, I want to, I just don't have enough time. We may be living with a metaphor of time as if it's a river that's just sweeping us helplessly along. Instead, we can choose language in everyday conversations that reflects the fact that we do have the power to make choices about time. So we can say things like, yes, this is an incredibly busy day, and this is the time for my daily walk. Or, yes, I have to answer that email, and I'll do it tomorrow, because this is our family time. The moment that we step out of a relationship with time as something that dominates us, we begin to experience more freedom in our choices in life. And this is especially important in our working life, that we pay attention to the way people talk about time. Many of us have worked in cultures where working longer hours is praised as a sign of dedication. The research indicates that productivity actually declines over time, which is why a four-day week 
is an advantage in any work that requires creative problem solving. But a shorter work week won't help us if we don't learn to set boundaries around work. Because meetings have a way of multiplying, and it's the demands that seem most inevitable that most need to be questioned, or we'll get swept away by time and lose ourselves. And that leads to the third way that we can break this habit and move into a mindset of greater freedom in times of change. We can practice ways of being present to ourselves. How about a show of hands? How many of us have ever picked up our phone just to pass the time, just to kill time? Yeah. Uh, and often it's, it's like the present moment is just something we need to get through. But when we do that, is it possible that we're numbing ourselves to thoughts and feelings that, if we listen to them, could help us make better choices? So how can we be more open to the gift of the present moment? One way is by immersing ourselves in activities where we truly enjoy being present. These may include spending time with people we love, reading a good book, going for a walk outside, gardening, bird watching, playing some golf, doing some woodworking, going for a swim, cuddling with a pet. We all have activities that settle us in the present moment. And by helping us step outside the drive of time, they help us to be present to our true selves, which exist outside of social constructs of time. Living in time is a gift, because we know there'll be a day when our life as we know it ends. Facing that reality inspires us to make today count. It may also help us to find ways to create legacies that will outlast us in our communities and in our relationships. And from that perspective, living in time is a gift that helps us to make more meaningful choices. We've talked about three ways that we can move into a mindset of greater freedom in times of change. First, we can pay attention to our assumptions about time, be aware of them. Two, we can pay attention to the language that we use about time in everyday conversations. And three, we can practice ways to be present to ourselves in the moment. We can all choose to weave these habits into our everyday lives. And when we do, we're choosing to live with greater freedom. And so it is helpful to ask ourselves this question. When you look back from the end of your life, what choice will you be glad that you made? And now, I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>